hello everybody. Um, my name's Chris Oldfield. I'm a, I'm a third year medic at Imperial College London. And today we're going to be going through um, neuro neuroscience for first and second years. Obviously, there are people here from lots of different courses, from lots of different universities and lots of different um, curriculums. So this is just going to be the first of two neuro tutorials that I'm doing. Um, if you have any questions at all at any point, just put them into the into the chat or, or put it onto the in the chat on Facebook and I'll be able to answer them. Uh, neuro can be quite a difficult topic, so it's better that you're able to have them explained to you than just to just to sit there and, and wonder what's going on. Uh, I, throughout it, I've got some some questions at different points, and that's on Mentimeter. Uh, so if you have a phone with you, you can scan this here. Or if you just go to menti.com and you can put in you can put in this code here, 336987, just so that you're ready for those questions when you come up. Uh, so yeah, any questions, ju just let me know and just send a message. So the things we're going to be going through today are firstly just the basic anatomy of, of the central and peripheral nervous systems. And then we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on the, the main sensory and the motor pathways of the CNS. Um, particularly the routes that they take, where they, where they decussate, and where the synapses are. Uh, we're then going to be looking at the, the main cells that you find in the CNS and, and the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system, and just explain uh, what their functions are. And then finally, we're going to look more at, at neurons in particular, how the resting membrane potential is set up, and then how the signal is passed through neurons and through synapses. So firstly, looking at just anatomy. Anatomy can be quite a dry topic because there's just a lot of, of sitting down and learning to do so, but it's really, really important that you understand the basics of it. So firstly, just to say, this is the setup of the peripheral nervous system. You can see that it's split into the somatic and the autonomic nervous systems. Somatic is what you control. If I decide to, to clap my hands or I decide to walk, that's somatic because it's an, a, a a choice that I make, whereas autonomic is things that happens automatically. So things like peristalsis in your gut, um, or or when you swallow, and that, when you swallow, it'll go from you chewing, which is somatic, to eventually becoming auto autonomic. And then as you can see here, the autonomic is split into two different types, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the parasympathetic you might have heard of as rest and digest, which is just the things that, that slows things down in your body uh, to relax, whereas the sympathetic is more of the fight or flight um, pathway. And what we've got below here is where these nerves exit the spinal, spinal cord. So the parasympathetic is found craniosacrally. Uh, the cranial nerves in particular that are parasympathetic are cranial nerves 3, 7, 9 and 10, and then also sacrally at S2, S3 and S4. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system uh, exits in the middle of those two points. So thoracolumbar is in the thoracic vertebrae and then the lumbar vertebrae. The central nervous system, on the other hand, is just your brain and your spinal cord, so it's very different. Um, so here you can see the um, cranial nerves and then all of the spinal nerves. And these 31 spinal nerves and these 12 cranial nerves uh, what make up all the, the nerve roots in your body. So there's 12 cranial nerves that you'll have to learn about. We're not going into the functions of each of these today. That'll be in the next tutorial. Um, and the spinal nerves here, they come out at different points and they're named based on the height at which they come out of your spine. So firstly, you have the cerv cervical nerves or cervical nerves, and there's eight of those. Then in your thoracic area, you have your thoracic nerves, uh, one to 12. And in the lumbar area, you have five nerves. Sacral nerves is one to five, and then you have one coccygeal nerve. Remember that uh, cranial and sacral were the parasympathetic, and then thoraco and lumbar were the sympathetic nervous system. And it's important to learn how many of each of these there are. So now just to look a bit at the central nervous system, this is obviously the brain. And what you need to know about this is uh, what each lobe of the brain is, and, and a little bit about what it all does. So firstly, uh, this is the front of the brain and this is the back. So this is the, the most forward part, which is obviously called the frontal lobe. Now the frontal lobe is basically what makes you, you. It's, it's your personality and uh, your thoughts and your emotions, um, as well as a lot of uh, 
regulation of, of function, it's, it's a lot of higher center things. So cognitive functions, for example. Next, you have the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is where sensation goes to, uh, as well as the sensory aspects of some um, senses, such as language, spatial orientation, and, and self-perception. At the back of the brain, we have the occipital lobe. And the main function of the occipital lobe is processing visual information. Hit the, here we have the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is mostly to do with uh, auditory information, so what you can hear. And finally, we have the, the cerebellum. And the cerebellum is the very basic functions that allow you to, to be able to live, such as um, regulating breathing and your drive to breathe. Uh, there are obviously lots of different areas in the brain that perform lots of different functions. But there's a couple that uh, I want to just point out. Um, you might have heard of these, which are Broca's area and Wernicke's area. So Broca's area is found in the frontal lobe. Um, and it is to do with the production of speech. So Broca's area is the is what makes you able to say things, whereas Wernicke's area, which is found in the temporal lobe, is to do with the understanding of speech. So when you get the information from your ears of what you're hearing or what you're reading from your eyes, it's taken to the temporal area, to Wernicke's area, to put all that information together and understand what it means. So there, are, this is obviously a brain. And there are a few key points, that a few key parts that you should know. This is just the basic anatomy of it. The majority of it is the cerebral cortex. Now, that's those four lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, that I spoke about before. Um, here we have the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is like the bridge. We obviously have the left, the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere of your brain. And the corpus callosum acts as the bridge between those two halves to pass information between them. Here you have the pituitary gland which sits anteriorly at the bottom. And that's involved in a lot of endocrine function. So that's a uh, release of particular hormones. It's split into the ante anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary. Here you have the brainstem, which is all of this bit here. The brainstem is split into three parts, which is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And you may have heard of these terms as well before. Here you have the cerebellum. Cerebellum just means little brain in, in, in the same way that cerebral is brain. Cerebellum is just little brain and it sits at the back inferiorly. So posteriorly and inferiorly of the cerebral cortex. And as I said, it's to do with the basic functions such as the drive to breathe. And then within the brain, it can be split into uh, gyruses and sulci. Uh, gyruses is like the hills, so the up bits and the sulci are like the ridges, um, which are the bits that go in. The brain is then surrounded by the meninges. Now there are three layers of the meninges and going from outside to in, they are the dura mater, the arachnoid membrane, and the pia mater. The dura mater is, is the thickest layer and follows the shape of your skull mostly. The, the arachnoid membrane will uh, mostly follow that as well, but some of the bigger sulci in your brain, such as between the two hemispheres, it will follow that path and go in. Whereas the pia mater is really closely adhered to your brain. So it will follow all the gyruses and the sulci and stay very, very close to your brain. The dura mater can be split into two different layers. There's the periosteal layer. Peri means next to and osteum is bone. And then there's the meningeal layer, which is closer to the arachnoid membrane. So the outside layer of the dura mater is the periosteal and the inside layer is the meningeal layer. It's important to note here that the, when the dura mater enters the spinal cord as opposed to the brain, it splits to only have one layer. So the periosteal layer returns back and wraps around on itself, whilst the meningeal layer carries on down towards the, um, that, towards the spinal cord. And then, Cerebrospinal fluid, I've, it's difficult to get any um, you guys to answer the questions here, so I'll just tell you. The cere cerebral spinal fluid, which is what CSF stands for, runs between the dura mater and the arachnoid membrane, so beneath the dura. Now here I've got a couple of questions, just to check. That was anatomy, I know, so it was a lot of me, me talking at you. But just to check your understanding, if you can put in the code 336987, and then we'll get to Menti. Hopefully we've got, we've got a few of you logged on. And 
we'll just put in this first question. Let me just hide the results. So feel free to, to fill this in. In which lobe can you find Wernicke's area? Let's give you a bit of time to, to fill that out and get logged on. There's a problem on Minty, it's not loading the presentation. It is. Okay, and we'll show you that one. The correct answer was the temporal lobe. Wernicke's area is to do with the comprehension of speech. And in the frontal lobe, which is why you might have got mixed up there, is Broca's area. So uh, the way that I remember that, uh, in terms of which one does which, is that alphabetically, Broca's is at the start of the alphabet. And the first thing you have to do is say the words. So, that, so that's to do with the production of speech. Whereas Wernicke's area is to do with the comprehension of speech. So that happens later and that's at the very end of the alphabet. Uh, and the next question. Which layer of the meninges can be split into the periosteal and the meningeal layers? Wait till we get to six. Okay, I'll give you 10 more seconds. Brilliant, let's see what you put. Perfect, again, the majority of you getting it right there. So the correct answer was the dura mater. Uh, and that's the one that can be split into the two layers. Periosteal meaning next to the bone. So that's the outside layer right next to your skull. And the meningeal layer is the inner layer. Again, if at any point you have any questions, just message the chat and uh, we can answer them for you. So next, we're going to be looking at the main sensory and motor pathways found uh, in the brain. Uh, as there's people from all different unis here, I'm not sure how much detail you need to be going into for this. It's obviously, neurology, as you can imagine, is can get very complicated. Uh, but I'm just going to point out the main ones that you need to know. So I think that these are the, are the key ones here. Uh, so first is the dorsal column. The dorsal column is to do with fine touch vibration and two-point discrimination. So all that this means is being able to feel things. So fine touch, is this is obviously a sensory pathway. Uh, and two-point discrimination is just the ability to tell between two different things that are touching you. So if I were to just touch myself with two fingers, that can tell how far apart they are. But if I get two things that are very small and really close together, you need this, these sensory fibers running up the dorsal column to tell you uh, where exactly they are and how far apart they are. Now this is split into two main, uh, they're called fascicles. The fasciculus gracilis, which runs more medially in the spinal cord, um, gives information from the lower limbs, whereas the fasciculus cuneatus brings information from the upper limbs. And we'll see on the next slide a little diagram showing that. Next we have the spinothalamic pathway, which is another sensory pathway, and this controls pain and temperature. The lateral corticospinal tract and the anterior corticospinal tract are the main motor pathways, and these are voluntary movement. So if I want to, to click my fingers or I want to go for a walk, I want to lift up my leg, they're all voluntary actions, and that runs down these two tracks. The main difference is that the lateral corticospinal tract mainly does your limbs, whereas the anterior corticospinal tract is mainly involved in your axial musculature, and the ax axial just means the bit of your body that's not your limbs and below your neck, so your torso mostly. Last, I've put in the vestibular spinal tract. Now, this is not as important. These top three are the, definitely the main three that you should know about. 
but just to be aware there's lots of other tracks as well so vestibular spinal is to do with coordination and balance and for example when i move my head to the side that my eyes follow in the right way and the room doesn't go all dizzy that's the vestibular spinal tract acting so here we have a, a slice of the spinal cord so you can see the main tracks you might notice that there's a few extra ones in there that we didn't speak about but i just want you to focus on the ones that i mentioned in the last slide so at the back you can see the fasciculus gracilis and the fasciculus cuneatus and these two make up the dorsal columns dorsal meaning back as in dorsal fin dolphin for example or dorsum meaning back and the dorsal columns if we remember were the main sensory pathways now the way to remember where exactly these are is if you think at the very bottom of the spinal cord, the fibers will be joining and then running up. So as you go higher up the spinal cord, there'll be more and more fibers joining and it'll be getting wider and wider. So at the very bottom, the first thing that joins will be the sensory fibers from your legs. So that's why it's more medial. And then once you go past above your, your arms, the sensory fibers from your upper limbs, so your arms and your hands, will be running in the fasciculus cuneatus. So that's why that one is a little bit more lateral. There's a spinous cerebellar tract, which I didn't mention before. Uh, and just, just so you're quickly aware what it is, it's proprioception. Now, proprioception is a really interesting concept, and it's the awareness of where your body is, where your limbs are, without having to use other senses, so without having to look at them. So, for example, I, I'm able to click without having to look at my eyes, use my eyes to look at my hand. And that's the idea of proprioception. It's an awareness of where your body is. Next, we have the lateral corticospinal tract, which you mentioned was motor, and it's mostly to your uh, limb musculature. Spinothalamic tract, we also mentioned as another sensory tract, which is pain and temperature. Now, you can see here, this is the first one that says contralateral. And we're going to look at the next slide about the routes that these different, uh, these different paths take. And we can see how some are ipsilateral and some are contralateral. The anterior corticospinal tract we also mentioned is axial musculature, so that's your torso. And that has some ipsilateral and contralateral. It can be a little bit confusing, that one. And then the anterior white commissure is this bit right in the middle that crosses the midline of your um, spinal cord. And you can see it says pain and temperature fibers cross here. So that's, that'll be the spinothalamic tract. So here you can see it says the spinothalamic tract is contralateral. And what this means is that when these fibers enter the level of the spinal cord, they immediately cross to the other side. And then they run up the opposite side, the contralateral side of your body. Uh, that, the term for crossing the midline is called decussating in, in medicine and in neuroscience. And as, a, that's a, as opposed to the ipsilateral fibers of the dorsal columns here and the lateral corticospinal tract. So, if I were just to feel something without, it's not painful or, or about temperature, it's just feeling my other hand, for example, that's gonna be my dorsal columns. So the information from the right-hand side of my body here is gonna be running up the right-hand side of my spinal cord. However, if that then is touching something painful or is testing temperature, that runs up the spinothalamic tract. So once that enters my spinal cord, it will cross over to the other side immediately in the spinal cord and run up the left-hand side of my body if it's coming from the right-hand side sensation. So here we can see three main tracks. I'm just going to click through so that you can see what they are. I'm actually going to start over here on the right-hand side, which is the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract he mentioned was to do with pain and temperature. And here you can see just what I was talking about. You have the, the nerve coming in from the right-hand side. And as soon as it enters the spinal cord, it crosses over to the left-hand side and then travels up your body on the left-hand side, which is the opposite side to the side that it entered. On the other hand, the dorsal columns, which is the sensation that's not pain or temperature, and the corticospinal tract, which is the main motor pathway. First, you will take the dorsal columns. It enters on the right-hand side and it runs up to the right-hand side. It doesn't cross over to the left until it reaches the medulla. We mentioned the medulla is the lowest part of the brainstem, the brainstem being the midbrain, then the pons, then the medulla. And so that's why this one is, deter is called ipsilateral, as it runs up the same side, ipsa meaning same, lateral side, 
as opposed to contralateral, which is spinothalamic, because it runs up the opposite side to where this enters. Now, we mentioned in the last slide that the corticospinal tract is a little bit different. Firstly, because it has anterior and lateral. And then secondly, because the anterior has some fibers that cross over and some fibers that stay on the same side. So first, if we just take the lateral corticospinal tract, this is, as we said, um, motor to your limbs mostly. So, oh, my mouse has just stopped working, there we are. So if, if the information runs comes in from the right-hand side, the lateral corticospinal tract will travel ipsilaterally until it decussates at the level of the medulla, and then it carries on on the left-hand side till it gets right up to your higher centers in your cerebral cortex. The anterior corticospinal tract is a little bit different. Some of the fibers cross over immediately at that level, whereas some fibers carry on staying up on this side. You don't need to know which ones do which because it does get a little bit complicated. But just remember that the lateral corticospinal tract is ipsilateral, whereas the anterior corticospinal tract has some contralateral and some ipsilateral fibers. The important thing to remember when looking at, at all of this is that the information from all of these tracks will eventually get to the opposite side to where they come from. So for your sensory information, either your normal sensation or your pain and temperature fibers, they will always end up in the opposite side of your brain. The only difference is at what level it crosses over. So just to go through that one more time, ipsilateral is where it continues up the spinal cord on the same level that it enters. Whereas contralateral is where it crosses over as soon as it enters the spinal cord and travels up on the opposite side. Okay. So the brain is split into many different sections, we said by gyruses and by sulci. This here is the central sulcus, which goes right down the middle of the brain. And the reason that I've put this into the slides is that on either side of the central sulcus are the two main areas for motor control and for sensory control. So the primary motor cortex is just anterior to the central sulcus whereas the primary somatosensory cortex is just posterior to the central sulcus. What this means is that the fibers that we see, if we just go back one slide, from this corticospinal tract, which is the motor tract, they originate up here in the cerebral cortex. And where that is, is just in front of the central sulcus. However, the fibers for the dorsal columns and the spinothalamic tract, as they go up towards the brain, where they end here and here, that will be just posterior to the central sulcus in the primary somatosensory cortex. Um, the central sulcus is also the line where the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe are separated. So that means that the primary motor cortex is in the frontal lobe, whereas the primary somatosensory cortex is in the parietal lobe. There's one more diagram here that you might have seen before. I know it looks a bit weird. And this is just looking at the primary somatosensory cortex in a little bit more detail. So what this is showing you is that there's a certain area of your brain that the information from a certain part of your body goes to. And it's mapped out in the same way that your body is. So it starts at the bottom of your body. You can see things like your leg and your feet at, the, at, at here. And then it, as you go down, you get higher and higher up to your arms. The hand is obviously a really big part because there's lots of sensory information coming from your hand. And then as you go up, it gets towards your face and your head here. So this mapped onto here, this is the most medial part, the closest to the middle. And then this becomes more lateral, so running down to here. The term for this is somatotopic. Somatotopic, soma meaning body, and topic as in the layout. Uh, topography is the, the lay of the land. So that's how you can, remember, you can remember what that means. And this is interesting because there's not many parts of your brain that this happens. Um, if you take the information going to your gut about peristalsis, lots of different areas of your brain will be firing off. There'll be one main area, but it's not very well mapped out in the same way that your primary somatosensory cortex is. Then what you can see with this man on the right is just that the size of the area 
for a certain part of your body is proportional to how many sensory fibers there are. So obviously the hands and the lips and the mouth are where the majority of your sensory fibers come from. Whereas somewhere like your torso, there's not a very large area, your trunk here, there's not a very large area of the primary somatosensory cortex that has to deal with that. Okay, so we've got a few more Menti questions now, just to check that's uh, all understood. So if we can go back to Menti. So which of the following decussates, and decussates means crossover, in the spinal cord? Brilliant, so we've got, we've got six responses now. Let's see what we put. Most people put spinothalamic tract and that is the right answer. The lateral corsica spinal tract does decussate immediately. Uh, the reason that it may, um, it may have confused you a little bit is the anterior corsica spinal tract has some fibers that decussate immediately that cross over at the level of the spinal cord. And now the next question on this. Just reload it. I'll hide the results. So which tract is responsible for motor function to the axial musculature? Okay, let's see what we've put. Okay, so we've got, we got a bit of a split here. So I purposely didn't tell you what axial meant. I didn't remind you here. So axial means your trunk, so it's not your limbs. So the lateral corticospinal tract supplies your limbs, your arms and your legs, whereas the anterior corticospinal tract is what deals with your axial musculature. So that's your torso. Brilliant. And then the final thing we're going to go through are the cell types of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And we're going to look a little bit at what each of those, uh, just one or two things that each of those cells do. And then also look at how neurons actually work and how the electrical impulse is able to travel along the neurons. Remember that if you have any questions at any point, please just drop it in the chat and let me know. So. Neuroglia is a term for all of the cells within the nervous system that aren't actually neurons. That is cells that don't um, have an electrical impulse able to, to pass through them. As we said before, that the nervous system is very complicated. And so there's lots of things that all these cells do. But I think that the most important thing is just to have one or two facts about each one so that you understand their basic points. Astroglia is the most common cell in your in your central nervous system. I've got a whole slide on the next slide of all the things that it does because it has so many different um, functions. So we'll look at that in a bit. Oligodendrocytes is also a cell of the central nervous system. And the oligodendrocytes are the myelin forming cells of the central nervous system. Now we'll look at myelin in just a little bit, but myelin wraps around the neurons and it allows for faster conduction of electrical impulses along the neurons. Um, the important thing to remember about oligodendrocytes 
is that each oligodendrocyte will produce uh, sheaths, so the myelin sheaths, for multiple neurons. And that's different, as we'll see in a second, to the Schwann cells, which are found in the peripheral nervous system, and they have a one-to-one -one ratio with neurons. Because their production is, because their main function is production, it, they're obviously very highly metabolically active. So they'll have lots of endoplasmic reticulum and lots of Golgi bodies, so that it's able to um, produce a lot of myelin for the neurons. Next, we have the microglia. The simplest way to think of microglia is the same as macrophages, but found within the central nervous system. So they're, to, they're the equivalent of macrophages that like you find in your normal immunology. So they're for immune surveillance. And then their job is antigen presentation. So if, you, if they come across a foreign body with a foreign antigen within your central nervous system, they're able to mount it onto their cell membrane, just as your normal macrophages are, and then present it to other cells to get the immune response going. Unlike all of the other central nervous system cells, these are actually produced in the bone marrow. So they're more along the lines of the immune response cells or white blood cells. And they also have a few other jobs. One of them is tissue remodeling and synaptic stripping, which is not too important. Next up, we have ependymal cells. Now, ependymal cells are what line the ventricles of the brain and the spinal cord. The, ventri the ventricular system is a system within your brain that has this, uh, the CSF running fluid, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. And um, it allows, it has a few different functions, CSF. I don't think we're going into it in this lecture, but we will do in the next one. Uh, and this, some of the functions are to provide metabolic, so it provides nutrients for some of the cells in your brain, as well as getting rid of waste products, like when you produce carbon dioxide, it needs to get rid of it. It also acts as a protection. So because you have this fluid running throughout around your brain, between your brain and uh, your skull, so it's remember it runs below the dura mater and above the arachnoid membrane. Um, if I shake my head around a little bit, it means that there's some liquid there to give it a bit of protection, to stop it from directly hitting against bone. Now, there are some specialized type of ependymal cells, which are called choroid plexus. And these are the ones that actually produce cerebrospinal fluid. It's probably just learning, learning this name. And finally, we have Schwann cells. Now, Schwann cells are found in the peripheral nervous system, unlike all of these, which are found in the central nervous system. And they uh, are found, they have a one-to-one -one ratio with neurons, unlike oligodendrocytes, which have multiple neurons, which are given myelin sheath by oligodendrocytes, whereas Schwann cells have a one-to-one -one ratio. I can remember this because in your brain, you're obviously very quite tightly packed for space. So you don't want to have uh, one oligodendrocyte producing myelin sheath for only one neuron. You want to maximize your space as, as much as possible. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, it's a lot bigger, you have a lot more space. So you have one Schwann cell per neuron. An interesting thing about Schwann cells is that it's able to promote axonal regeneration. You may have heard that your central nervous system can't regenerate. So if you were to have an accident and you cut your spinal cord, you would not be able to regenerate those nerves that get damaged. Whereas if I were to lose some sensation to my finger, then the nerves that supply it may be able to, to regrow. And they, uh, that's because of the ability of Schwann cells. Now, I promised that I'd, I'd talk about astroglia. As you can see, there, it has lots and lots of different functions. I've highlighted these three at the top because I think that these are the only important ones that you should really know about. So I'll just quickly go through these. Firstly is that it acts during uh, embryology. So it acts as a scaffold for when neurons are able to start going to the different places of your brain and as the, as the fetus starts forming. It's actually really interesting how the neurons are able to kind of climb along the astroglia. Uh, and of course, this is extremely complicated. Um, so that's just they're necessary during development. What I think is probably the main function is the formation of the blood brain barrier. So you will have heard of the blood brain barrier. And the point of this is that you don't want damaging substances getting to your brain. If you have high levels of toxic substances in your peripheries, it's obviously bad for you. But if you allow that to enter your brain, that could be deadly. So you want to really tightly restrict what's able to get from your blood into your brain. 
And there's two ways that this is mainly looked up, this is mainly done. Firstly, the actual capillaries in your brain are discontinuous capillaries. And this means that the cell membranes, uh, and there's, there's very little distance between the cells that line the capillaries in the brain. So that nothing can just leak out between the cells. You then also have astroglia. And astroglia have lots of uh, feet at the end of them. They're called podocytes, which means feet. And these cover the outside of the capillaries just to really stop anything from escaping that you don't want to escape. And what that means is that you can then put in um, different cell membrane channels within, within the capillaries. So you can let in and out the specific substances that you want because you do need still, still need some things to go from the blood to the brain and vice versa. But having this blood brain, blood brain barrier allows that to be really highly controlled. And then the final thing that I think is important is the removal of neurotransmitters. So um, you all have heard of lots of different neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, noradrenaline, adrenaline, dopamine, serotonin. These are all different types of neurotransmitters that work at different parts of your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. And within the brain, uh, the astroglia are there to mock those up. So once you've released your neurotransmitter to act in your synapse, you don't want it there forever because then that will keep binding to the postsynaptic junction and keep tricking that neuron. So one of the ways that you get rid of that neurotransmitter once it's entered the synapse is you have astroglia there to mop it up. So as I said, you can read all these other functions if you want, but I really think that these three are the most important ones. So that's it for the non-neuronal cells. And now we're just gonna look a little bit more about neurons. It's important to understand the basic structure of them. So that's why I've put in this side. This is what we call a multipolar neuron, which means that it has lots of different terminals here. So firstly, we have the dendrites. And as you can see, there are multiple dendrites and the dendrites are what receive the information from other neurons. In the middle here, we have the, the nucleus and the cell body. And then we have one axon traveling away. The axon terminal is the end of the axon. So this terminal will then be able to synapse with a dendrite from another cell to pass the information on from one cell to the next. You'll notice this only has one axon leaving it, and that's really important. Every single cell will have one axon. It may then split into multiple axon terminals, but you will only have one axon traveling away from the cell body. On the other hand, you have multiple dendrites, so each neuron can bring in lots of information, and then all that information will be passed down one axon. And you can see here the myelin sheath. And we'll talk a little bit later about how that helps with neuronal conduction. Uh, neurons, because they require a lot of ATP, they're quite metabolically active cells. So within this cell body, there'll be, just as we said with oligodendrocytes, there'll be lots of rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, a quite a large nucleus because it's going to be doing a lot of transcription uh, and also lots of mitochondria to help produce lots of ATP and a very highly organized cytoskeleton because the neurotransmitters that you're making within the cell body, you want those neurotransmitters to be able to move along the cell to the axon terminal so they can then be uh, sent out there and just moved around the cell in general. Now, there are a few other types of cell. What we just saw there was a multipolar cell, and this is by far the most abundant cell in the central nervous system, where you obviously, like I said before, a really tight space. You want the maximum amount of information to be passed between cells. Uh, so you want the most um, volume effective cells. So the or most CNS cells are multipolar cells, and these are also found as your motor cells within your spinal cord and within autonomic ganglia. Now, autonomic, we said it was just the cells that are opposed to, to somatic, and autonomic is, this, is the information that you can't control. So, carry out peristalsis, or travel to the, the, the trusa the muscle at the top of my uh, bladder to squeeze when you need to go to the toilet. So multipolar cells are by far the most important. But there are just a few other here that I think you might need to be aware of. Unipolar doesn't really, isn't in humans, I think it's most, uh, so worry about that, you won't really see it. Bipolar, on the other hand, you will see, 
And the main place where you see this is in the retina. If you you might if you've done some more neuro, you might have heard of the the bipolar cells, retinal bipolar cells, or also in your vestibular cochlear nerve, which carries auditory information and information about balance from your ear to your brain. And then finally, we have pseudo unipolar cells, <clears throat> and these are the sensory cells of the peripheral nervous system. So this is very similar to the other ones, except for that the cell body is held away from the axon. So you have your sensory receptor here, which will be telling me that there's some sensation in my hand, if it's, for example, my, my dorsal columns, or it can be telling me about pain or temperature, if it's my spinothalamic tract, and it'll pass that up through here. So you might or might not I've heard of the, of the resting membrane potential is set up within a cell. Now this can be quite complicated, but I'll do my best to explain it to, so that everyone can understand. Um, so within your cells of the body, you normally have lots of potassium inside your cells and lots of sodium outside your cells, so in your blood. And that happens for all of your cells in your body. If it's your, your epithelial cells, your hepatocytes in your liver, there's a lot more potassium within them and sodium on the outside. Neurons are special though, because they contain certain channels which allows the potassium to leave. And the potassium will want to leave because if there's a much higher concentration of it intracellularly than, out, than extracellularly, then it'll want to be moving down a concentration gradient just by diffusion through these channels. However, as potassium leaves, potassium is positively charged and it enters the extracellular area, which is here, which we said that the extracellular area has lots of sodium in it and sodium is, is also positively charged. So as potassium leaves, whilst it's moving down a concentration gradient, it will increase the positive charge on the outside. As the positive charge builds up, that positive charge will create an electrical gradient, which will be wanting to drive the potassium from extracellularly to intracellularly. And the resting membrane potential occurs when the rate at which potassium is pushed out of the cell down the concentration gradient, and the rate at the rate at which potassium is pushed back into the cell down the electrical gradient balances out. And this is important because it's not that it hits a level and suddenly there's no more diffusion of potassium across either way. Diffusion, uh, potassium still goes out of the cell and in, but the net change is zero. Okay. So this is just a little table. You really don't need to worry about the numbers or anything at, at this stage. Uh, it's just to show you about the, the main ions that are found within the, within the cells and then extracellularly as well. And the main two lines to look at here are the sodium and the potassium. And you can see that the potassium is mostly intracellularly and the sodium is mostly extracellularly. And you have bits of other ions as well floating around, um, but sodium and potassium are the two key ions in setting up the resting membrane potential. Now we're going to look a little bit at um, we're going to look a little bit at some some graphs now, and I just wanted to label what each bit of the graph means. So here at minus seventy is the resting membrane potential that we've just set up and we've just spoken about. One, once a cell gets triggered to fire, it will depolarize. And depolarize will be going from minus 70 towards zero. And we'll look at how that happens on the next slide. It will then go past zero and go to overshoot. And that's when it will just go a little bit past, past zero. It, might, it goes to around 30, 30 megavolts. Once it's sent that information, it's depolarized, it then wants to get back to its resting membrane potential so that it's able to fire again. And that's where you have repolarization. Now repolarization gets you back to 70. And in fact, you go a little bit further and you go down to minus 90, which is called hyperpolarization, before you return and you settle on minus 70, which is your resting membrane potential. And we'll look at the next slide about why exactly that happens. So, here you can see an uh, action potential being fired, and you can see everything that we just explained. 
The key term is here, which I've hidden with this box, which is that once you get to around minus 55, there's a sudden large increase. That is called the upstroke. So what happens is you get the signal from another, from another uh, neuron to fire. And when you get that signal, a few of your channels will open and your, your, and your membrane potential will slightly raise. However, if only a few channels open and it goes from minus 70 to about minus 60, and then there's no more signal for more channels to open, there won't actually be any action potential fired. However, once it hits minus 55, which is here called the threshold potential, then you suddenly get a massive um, positive uh, response, a positive feedback response, which causes all of the channels to open and you suddenly get a massive rise. So you get massive depolarization, you go to overshoot to about plus 30 before you return back with the repolarization. So the cells that respond, the, the two channels that are, are responsible for this are the sodium channels and the potassium channels. So if we just think about the, the picture of what we've got for the resting neuron that sat at minus 70, is that there's lots of sodium on the outside and then there's lots of potassium on the inside. Even though you've sent some potassium out, there's still more intracellularly than there is extracellularly. So when the sodium channels open, you'll have a rush of sodium from extracellular. And we said here that sodium is positively charged, so that will increase the membrane potential by making it more positive. Now the potassium channels open as well. I remember that potassium wants to go from inside to outside, but they take a little bit longer to respond. So that allows this large increase to happen before the potassium channels opening causes this repolarization here. And again, that's potassium going from intracellularly, where it's more concentrated, to extracellularly. And as potassium is positively charged as well, if you have a positive charge leaving the cell, then the membrane potential will drop. Now that's explained the blue bit, the green bit and the red bit, but then there's this yellow bit here, and that's what we call the refractory period. Now the refractory period is where the neuron is unable to fire again because you don't want the neuron to immediately fire continuously. You want to give a little break so that it's able to reset its resting membrane potential before it then gets sent another signal to fire again. And there are two stages to the refractory period. Firstly is the absolute refractory period. And during this time, however much I send a signal for that cell to fire, it won't be able to. The reason that that happens is that in your sodium channels, you have two ways that block it off. There's an activation gate and an inactivation gate. So during the absolute refractory period, the inactivation gate is closed. And that's like a ball that physically covers the channel. And so if there's a physical blockage, however much I try and send a signal to open that channel, it's impossible for it to get through. Then during the refractory, um, the relative refractory period, that's to do with the activation gate. So the ball moves out of the way, but the channel is still closed. What that means is that if I send enough of a signal for it to fire, then it will eventually fire. And so once you've had the absolute and the refractory period and the relative refractory period, you get back to your resting membrane potential at about minus 70. And that's how the signal travels along the neuron. Now, once it gets to the end of the neuron, you reach the synapse. And this is the synapse. A lot, this is very similar to what you'll have seen in, in A-level biology and chemistry. So I won't go into it in too much detail. But as the signal travels along, the membrane depolarization travels along, it reaches the very end of the synapse. And within the synapse, you'll have vesicles, which are these little circles here, which are full of neurotransmitter. In this case, I've gone for ACH, which is acetylcholine. And as the membrane depolarization reaches the synapse, it causes calcium channels on the edge of the membrane here to open and a massive influx of calcium. On the table earlier, you'll see that calcium is in much, much higher concentration extracellularly than it is intracellularly. The calcium causes the vesicle to fuse with the end of the synapse. And that vesicle will then enter the synapse and be able to bind to the neuron on the other side of the synapse so that the, so that the membrane depolarization can then start in that next neuron. And that's how you pass information from one neuron to then carry on the information through the next one. 
Now, uh, there's one extra bit of information I want to talk about, which is the snare complex. And the snare complex is just the mechanism by which the vesicle binds to the uh, end of the, of the um, terminal and is able to release the neurotransmitter into the synapse. You might have heard of that before. Now, I've been promising throughout that I'll talk about the um, Schwann cells, which produce myelin. And they between the bits of the myelin is what we have are called nodes of Ronvier. Now, the interesting thing about myelin is that it's not the presence of it that makes it go faster, but it's the bits where myelin isn't there that allows for the conduction of, of neurons. So what, uh, what happens is, as opposed to the information traveling along and every sodium and potassium ion channel opening as you go along, um, if the channels open here, that gets sensed here, and then these channels open, and the propagation, the action potential, jumps between these bits between the myelin. So you can see the direction of propagation here, which is the direction that the information is passing through the, the neuron. And so that means that it can travel a lot quicker because it doesn't have to open every single channel. It can just open channels at certain bits. Now, remember from that cells slide we had earlier, this is produced, myelin is produced by Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system and by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system. One more thing I wanted to mention about the, the transmission is that there are two different things that affect the speed of transmission. Firstly, is the presence of myelin. And the more myelin you have, the faster it will be able to go. And secondly, is the diameter of the neuron. And the, the wider the diameter, so the thicker the neuron, the faster it's able to propagate along the neuron. Finally, I just wanted to talk about how nerves are actually packaged up. So you can see here, this is one neuron and it's surrounded by myelin sheath. And around each neuron, you have the endoneurium, which is this around here. It's just a surrounding capsule, basically. Now, each of these neurons are packaged up into a collection of lots of different neurons, and they're called fascicles. And fascicles are surrounded by the perineurium, which again, just groups them all together. And then finally, you have a few different fascicles along with some blood vessels, because remember that neurons are quite highly metabolically active cells. So they're gonna need oxygen quite a lot to um, produce all of their neurotransmitters and things like that. So they need their own blood supply as, as well. And when all these fascicles are bundled together, that's surrounded by the epineurium or epineurial capsule. And that's what f forms a nerve. So that's how you get from a single neuron, as it's packaged up, you eventually get to a whole nerve. Um, and that's, that's the last slide. So I'm just gonna go now to the final few questions of Menti, just to check that we've got it all. And here is the question. I'll just hide the, hide the results so you can't see what each other are putting. And the question is, which of the following ions are found in the highest concentration intracellularly? And this is for all cells of the body as well as uh, neurons. Okay, because it's the end, I'll uh, I'll show what you've all put. Brilliant. So most people have gone for potassium, and potassium is the is the highest found intracellularly. Now, calcium is interesting because the levels of calcium. If you look at the table, I know I went on from that side quite quickly, but the the concentration of calcium is really really low. It's actually higher extracellularly. And it may have looked, if you looked at the table, it may have looked like it's really high intracellularly, but actually it was at times 10 to the minus four, which means it's a really, really small concentration found intracellularly. And then the final question, I'll hide your results again, is which cells are important in forming the blood brain barrier?
and we come to the end of the hour, so I'll, I'll show you the results now. And brilliant, most of you got it right again. So that's Astroglia. Astroglia are the ones that we said has loads of different functions. And there are a few main ones I wanted you to know about. One was scaffolding in embryology so that neurons know where they're meant to be going. Uh, the second one was this, forming the blood brain, blood brain barrier. And then the final function that I highlighted on that slide was uh, mopping up neurotransmitters. Brilliant. So that's the end. Uh, I've got a little a feedback form. It would be great if you could fill out the feedback form so I know what to improve for next time. Um, you'll be able to get to the slide, get the slides. I'm sure they'll be going up uh, on the Becoming a Doctor website. And uh, there'll be a second neuro tutorial from me if you want to if you want to see more. And that'll be coming up in the next few weeks. So, so keep an eye out for that. And please do fill out the feedback. So thank you all for watching. If you have any questions, message the Becoming a Doctor and we'll be able to get back to you. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Chris, for that uh, really, really great tutorial. I think a lot of us in uh, who are junior doctors and final years are all day tuning in, uh, probably thought back to our own lectures, which weren't as interesting. So thanks for making that really interactive and really fun. Cheers. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to your next lecture. Um, and we'll be making this available afterwards, as Chris said, um, to make sure that you're on the mailing list uh, to get updates for that and share it across to your friends and colleagues as well who might want to join in to uh, the upcoming uh, tutorials. Great. Thanks very much again, everyone, and uh, have a lovely evening. Thanks, everyone.